promises of God. <laughs> Reading a little hard after that bit of exercise there. All right, please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, over to Acts chapter 27. We're looking again, part four, sailing slow after fast, verses 1 through 12. Acts chapter 27, verses 1 through 12. And while you're turning to that text, let me mention again what we mentioned this morning. You're all invited to a, a pastor happy day tomorrow for Labor Day, uh, by the grace of God, providing a picnic for everybody in the church who doesn't have some place to go tomorrow. And so you are invited to that. We'll be meeting here at 1 o'clock, and then uh, hopefully everybody will be here by 1.15, and then driving to the uh, park and setting up for a picnic. And I think you will find that it is a very very nice, not just picnic, barbecue, of many, many different kinds of meat and all kinds of different side dishes, and I think you'll enjoy it. So please, join us tomorrow if you are here. We're not saying this for everybody out there in the world. This is for the people who attend church today. Um, and if there's a real special petition, we might let them here too. But anyway, tomorrow we invite you to that. We're in Acts chapter 27. Tonight, looking at part four, sailing slow after fast, verses one through 12. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus band. And entering into a ship of Adramitium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coasts of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing unto Italy, and he put us therein. And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Canidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmone. And hardly passing it, came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already past, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul, and because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain unto Phoenice and there to winter, which is an haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for your word and for its power, for the many things that you have given to us in the scriptures, and as we study them, as we examine them, you open them to us and you open our hearts to the scriptures, that we might not only know facts, but that we might know you, the true and living God, who you are, what you do, how you operate, what you expect of us, and the way in which you empower us to fulfill your will. Father, we thank you so much for this portion of scripture tonight, and we pray for your blessings on it as we study your word together, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you remember that last week we began to develop the sixth element in our list of eight elements that God uses in the life of every believer to conform that believer to the image of Christ. Number six out of eight. I hope you wrote the list down. The sixth element was the specific destinations and goals that God has for your life. In other words, the specific will of God for your life. And you can know it. You can know it without question. Quick review. The fast in our text is the text is Yom Kippur, uh, the Day of Atonement. Yom HaKippur is the full name of it, but we call it Yom Kippur normally. That was required by God to be celebrated by the Jews on the 10th day of Tishri, the seventh month of the Jewish calendar, from sundown on the 9th to sundown on the 10th of the month. Yom Kippur, as we said, is generally in October. This year it will be, it's coming up, October 12th, a very dangerous time to sail in the Mediterranean. Last week I contrasted and compared Yom Kippur with Tisha B'Av, or the ninth of Av, in, which is one of the Hebrew months. And it's instructive, I think, as we 
review this, to remember that there is a contrast between them because one relates to the sovereign will of God as revealed in scripture and one relates to the sovereign will of God as felt by the Jews through history. Yom Kippur was one of the divine feasts or festivals. It wasn't actually a feast, but it was a festival ordained by God. It was a day of fasting, a day of special sacrifices that God required of the Jewish people. It is completely fulfilled in Christ. That's why we don't have to offer those sacrifices anymore. All the rest of the feasts that God ordained were days of feasting and not fasting. But Yom Kippur was a day of repentance and mourning for sin. We saw that Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, was given by God for two different reasons. Number one, to cover all the sins that had been committed during the year that had not been dealt with by the people, the priests, and even the high priest. And secondly, it was to be a day upon which the year of Jubilee would be proclaimed after 49 years, the 50th year. There were specific rules that God set down for all the activities that were to take place on Yom Kippur. We read Leviticus 16, you remember, last week in which God gives specific instructions for Yom Kippur after God himself killed Nadab and Abihu when they offered strange fire on the altar of God. That was Leviticus 10. We saw that in Leviticus 16, God ties that event of the death of Nadab and Abihu, God ties their death to the Day of Atonement, even though it's six chapters earlier. God made that very clear in Leviticus 16, 1 and 2. The Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. And I told you that's what's inscribed on my wedding band. Very important to understand that connection because Yom Kippur gives to us a picture of God's judgment of sin. A judgment that can fall on an entire nation if in fact that sacrifice was not made on Yom Kippur. If in fact the high priest did not go inside the veil. They even tied a rope to his ankle so that in case he died before God, they could pull him out rather than having him just die and rot there because there was no way anybody else could go in behind the veil. They had the bells on the bottom of their robes, which would tinkle as they moved, so they could tell that he was still moving, that he was still alive. Yom Kippur is a very serious day. It still is a very serious day for the Jews. But they don't have the sacrifice anymore. When I was in Israel, I learned that one of the things that the Orthodox Jews do on Yom Kippur, the Orthodox rabbi will stand in front of the congregation, and he will slit the throat of a chicken, grab its feet, and swing it around his head so that the blood out of the chicken's neck sprinkles all over the congregation. There's nothing in scripture about the blood of a chicken atoning for sin. But they realize that they have not had a lamb sacrifice offered in the temple behind the veil for 2,000 years. One of the reasons that many young people among the Jewish young people today no longer want to have anything to do with Judaism, they've gone secular. They may still attend a reformed Jewish congregation, which are basically the secular Jews, but they don't believe the Bible because after all, if the Bible's true, they're without hope because they have no blood sacrifice and they have rejected the one that God himself has provided in Christ. The principles taught in these Old Testament passages that I just listed for you and quickly without going over them again, the principles taught in those passages are very important for us today. They are transdispensational principles because they are quoted in the New Testament. In Hebrews chapter 9 verses 1 through 28, we won't read that again, but we read that whole passage and commented on it last week. In Hebrews 9, we're specifically told that the mercy seat, where that blood was sprinkled on Yom Kippur once a year, was a foreshadowing of Christ. I'll give you just a few of those verses. Almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. You see, the tabernacle on earth is a reflection of what really is in heaven. And so now he says we have to have a better sacrifice 
for the heavenly tabernacle. For Christ, and here we see, is the fulfillment of that typology. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true. That is, those are the types and pictures. That's what the word figures is dealing with. But into heaven itself, Jesus entered not behind the veil on earth. Jesus entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. You see, he's our great high priest, the high priest of the Jewish people, a descendant of Aaron, once a year on Yom Kippur, went behind the veil. Jesus is our great high priest, not from the tribe of Levi, not from the descent of Aaron. He's from Judah, of which the book of Hebrews points out, nothing is spoken concerning the Aaronic priesthood. He is of the Melchizedekian priesthood. Hebrews chapter 7 makes that clear. But it says that he goes in now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Because sin got started in the first generation, didn't it? Sin got started with Adam and Eve. And that passed down to us all the way to today. So if it was only a human being, if Jesus were only a human being like you and I, he would have had to have died over and over and over and over again, which is what Catholic theology teaches. They teach the sacrifice, the blasphemy of the Mass, that every time the host is elevated, Jesus is sacrificed again. It's called the perpetual sacrifice of the Mass. For then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. We can't emphasize how strongly, or too strongly, how much we find in the Old Testament sacrifices that reflects for us who Jesus is and what he did. The Jews had it as a picture all the way from the giving of the law all the way down to the present day. But as Paul explains in Romans, their eyes are blinded. They have a veil of blindness over their eyes that they can't see until God himself takes away that veil. Then we talked about the significance of the scapegoat and the Lord's goat, both of which represent different aspects about the death of Christ. The scapegoat bore the sins of the people far away outside the camp, even as Christ took our sins as far as the east is from the west. The Lord's goat was slain and his blood shed, as was Christ, for Christ had to die for our sins. In contrast to Yom Kippur, Chaba'av is a day of mourning practiced by the Jew in remembrance of all the horrible things that happened to them, beginning with the destruction of the first temple. That's the temple of Solomon. This year, Tisha B'Av fell three weeks ago on August 13th. It is not a festival commanded by God. It's a human memorial day, sort of like we have our memorial days. But it was established by the Jews who see how many bad things have happened to them over the centuries on or near that day. But they're not a day of repentance for them. It's just a day of great sorrow and sadness. God commands genuine repentance. Human beings want to say, well, we don't really want to repent. We just want to be sorry about it. And you know, a lot of times we come into God's presence that same way. We don't want to really repent of our sins. We feel very bad about things that happen to us that are bad, but we don't want to repent, which is what Yom Kippur is all about. So I read you a whole list of the various horrible things that have fallen on or near that day over the centuries. We'll not go over that again. But that set the stage for us to look at the fast, the Yom Kippur that's in our text. Paul, being a Jew with the Day of Atonement ingrained in his soul in the memory of the destruction of the first temple on Shabbat, and it says, now the fast has already passed. So he has just gone past Yom Kippur. And very soon after the events in our text, the second temple is going to get destroyed by Herod on the very same day. And that helped put our 20 questions into perspective. And that's the perfect setting to learn about element number six in determining the will of God for our lives. I won't read you the 20 questions again, but we remember that there are three essential will of God principles when you feel sorry for yourself, like those 20 questions point out. The three principles, the essential will of God principles, when you feel sorry.
Why are these bad things happening to me? You're back in Chaba Av when you're thinking about that instead of Yom Kippur. But think about the principles related to the will of God. Number one, God can do it without you. Number two, his primary purpose in your life is to conform you to the image of Christ. Three, he can strong on the entire universe to accomplish his purpose for your life, for his own glory and the glory of his son, Jesus Christ. And we saw that truth in Romans 8, verses 28 through 30. I won't read that again for you. Most of you know those verses by heart. Then we looked at those verses in their context and saw that in our text, Paul is dealing with the will of God in much the same setting as described in Romans 8, 25 through 27. And we drew two conclusions. Number one, God is on your side when you feel this way and nothing can resist him. So cheer up. Number two, when you feel frustrated that your plans are not being accomplished like you want or as fast as you want, remember the most important thing is not your plan, but God's plan for your life and he is never late. So even if it seems to be dragging along, you're sailing slow after fast, God is never late. And so we can count on that. And then we closed with when you feel frustrated at how slow everything is going, remember these words. What shall we then say to these things? This is Romans 8 again, verse 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And you know how that passage closes. In all these things were more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a magnificent conclusion. So when you feel like things are dragging along, remember the promises of Romans 8, beginning in verse 25 and taking it all the way down through verse 39. Okay, so that's the foundation which we have covered last week of studying the will of God for our lives, principle number six in our text. Tonight, if you have your paper and pencil, I'm going to give you ten truths about knowing the will of God for your life, specific direction and goals for your life. That's principle number six. I'm going to give you a list of ten different truths about principle number six on how to know the will of God for your life. Number one. Now, most of us, when we're talking about the will of God, before I give you principle number one, most of us are pretty well familiar with the sovereignty of God and pretty well familiar with all the divine principles that uh, deal with how God is in control of everything. Tonight, I want to talk more about the issue of our responsibility and its relationship to the will of God. Our responsibility and the relationship to the will of God. Principle number one, or truth number one about that principle six. Number one, certain passages tell us that we are personally responsible for doing the will of God. You are personally responsible. I am personally responsible. We are all personally responsible for doing the will of God. You can't blame God for your failure, and you can't blame the sovereignty of God for preventing you from doing his will. He wants you to do his will more than you want to do his will. But he makes it clear that you are personally responsible for doing the will of God. For example, Mark chapter 3, verse 35. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. Jesus puts the burden squarely back on our shoulders. You know the will of God, then you must obey the will of God. You can't say, well, God, you didn't, you didn't empower me to do your will. Yes, God did. He gave you the power. He gave you the indwelling Holy Spirit. You can't say, but God, I didn't really know your will. Yes, you did. It's in the word of God. You didn't study the word of God. You say, but God, there were other people forcing me to do something else. No, God always moves heaven and earth to make sure you're in the center of his will. We're the ones who stubbornly disobey and resist. Very strong words in scripture, and Jesus says we're responsible and we are accountable for obeying. Number two, there are other passages in scripture that remind us of men who clearly did the will of God. Other passages in scripture clearly remind us 
of men who did the will of God. So we know it's possible even before the coming of the Holy Spirit. They tell us that God's will for us does not relate to the past. There's no reincarnation. By the way, that's very important. There's a guy who used to come to this church here uh, who believed that he was a reincarnation of Abraham and uh, he argued for it quite vociferously. Uh, but we'll see in a moment from the verse that I'm about to read you that the will of God does not relate to the past or to the hypothetical future. You know, we use the excuse, well, I'll do the will of God when I get around to it. The will of God relates to the present. What are you doing right now? Because you don't know what will be in the future. And you cannot change the past. God put us here to serve this generation. Let me show it to you in Scripture. Over in Acts chapter 13, verse 36. For David, after he had served his own generation, now listen to the next few words, by the will of God fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. Context is talking about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And David is used here as an illustration. David, speaking in the Psalms, speaks about how the Messiah would not see corruption. But in that context, we find that David did the will of God. And what was the will of God? To serve his own generation. Folks, that's the will of God for us, too. We can't change the past. And we can't do anything about the future because we might die tonight. But we can be in the center of God's will right now. Number three. There are other passages that indicate we don't always know the specific will of God, although we can find it out. But there are some passages that indicate we don't always know the specific will of God. But listen, but we keep on moving in the direction of service until he changes our course. We don't always know the specific will of God, but we keep moving in the direction of service until he changes our course. You don't just sit still and do nothing. Or some people say, well, I don't really know the will of God, so I guess that means I can be on vacation until God reveals his will to me. And they don't move forward on anything. They lounge and lollygag around on the beach and wait until the waves come over them and drown them. God shows his will to people who are moving in all the direction that he gives to them and all the light that he gives to them. And as they obey, as they draw closer to the light, they learn his will more precisely. We find that was what the Apostle Paul did. For example, Romans chapter 1, verse 10. Making a request, if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Paul recognized that God could short-circuit his plans. I mean, that happened to Paul when he was, of course, going to Jerusalem to finish up his vow, uh, you know, when he was going to shave his head, the Nazarite vow that we've talked about. His plans got changed. Because he got arrested, was going to get beaten to death. The Romans uh, rescued him. He went through all kinds of problems till we get to the point we're at today where he is on ship, chained up, and heading for Rome under the guard of a Roman centurion who will not listen to him. But you know what? He knew something. He knew, ah, so this is how God is going to get me to Rome. Because God told me already that I'm going to preach the gospel to kings. Hey, who's higher than Caesar? He'd already preached to King Agrippa, and now he's heading for the top dog himself. But he was moving when God changed his course. Here's another one, Romans chapter 15, verse 32. That I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may be with you refreshed. He's saying, you know, that's my plans. But, you know, God might change my course. God may make things turn out a little differently than they've turned out so far. But by the will of God, my plan is to come to you. Number four. Number four. The will of God is central to the ministry that the Holy Spirit plays in our lives. The will of God is central to the ministry that the Holy Spirit plays in our lives. This is out of Romans 8. Did you pick it up? 
in verse 27? I read it just a moment ago when I read those three verses, 25, 26, and 27. Listen carefully, because it talks about the will of God. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Romans chapter 8 tells us that the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. But he does it according to the will of God. Romans 8 also tells us that our Lord Jesus Christ ever lives to make intercession for us. In other words, he's praying for us also. The Holy Spirit is an interceder before the throne. The Lord Jesus Christ is an interceder before the throne. Those are both in Romans chapter 8, end of the passage here. But it's according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit never makes intercession for us outside of the will of God. Do you think the Holy Spirit knows the will of God? Do you think he does? Yes, I think he does. He is God. He's a member of the Trinity. But he's actually interceding for us. We say, but the will of God's going to happen anyway, right? Well, that's sovereignty of God. Sure enough, it will happen. So why does the Holy Spirit have to pray for us? Well, you'll have to talk to God about that. He hasn't told us why. He simply told us he does. He makes intercession for us according to the will of God. The will of God is central to the ministry that the Holy Spirit plays in our lives. And God always answers the Spirit with a yes answer. Just like the Father always answered Jesus with a yes answer. Though Christ submitted himself to the will of the Father when it came to the cross. Number five. Number five. Specific aspects of the will of God are clearly revealed in Scripture. Some things you don't know, like what's going to happen in the future? You know, am I going to grow up? Am I going to get married? Uh, am I going to have kids? Uh, am I going to be, you know, a millionaire? Am I going to be this or that? Uh, will the country fall apart? Uh, will this next election bring the total demise of the United States of America? Will Russia invade Israel within the next two years? You know, we don't know those things. But there are some things, there are specific things, that God's will is clearly revealed in the scripture, and, listen to this last half, because this is important to get it down, and that are tied to our moral responsibility and accountability before God. That are tied to our moral responsibility and our accountability before God. Now this one, number five, is the one about which the New Testament speaks the most. There are more passages on the will of God dealing with our moral responsibility and accountability before God within his will than on any of these other parts, ten elements that I'm talking about right now. This is the big one. I'll only give you a few verses. I've got six of them written down here. You know verse the first one because I quote it to you often, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Now, these are the aspects of the will of God that are clearly revealed in Scripture that are tied to our moral responsibility and our accountability before God. Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect. What? What are the last three words? will of God you're supposed to do it it's a command and you're supposed to do it to prove something you're to prove the will of God in relation to your transformed mind in relation to your transformed life the fact that you are no longer being conformed to the world the will of God for you is not to be conformed to the world how many of us resist God on that point we want so badly to be like the world around us. There's a command in Scripture. God doesn't give commands unless he holds you accountable for it. Did you know that? If he gives you a command, he's going to hold you accountable for it. And in the New Testament, God always provides the strength and resources to obey his commands. 
In the Old Testament, they did not have the indwelling Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit permanently lives inside of you. You have the resources to say no to sin. You have the resources to say yes to righteousness, which you could not do when you were dead in trespasses and sins. God does empower those who will obey. How about Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6? Here again, moral responsibility and accountability before God as related to his will. Not with eye service as men pleasers, this is obeying servants obeying their masters, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Did you know that's the will of God, how you are to act in the context of employment? You see, the will of God touches on a lot of very specific things. Here are servants being told to obey their masters and to do it in such a way that it glorifies Christ because that is the will of God. The reason you do it is because you're servants of Christ. You may have an ugly, awful human master or boss, as we call him today. But you look past the boss. You look to Jesus and say, Lord, this is what you told me to do, and so I'm doing it because I serve you. Then you prove the will of God, doing the will of God from the heart. How about 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5? And this they did, not as we hoped. This is dealing with giving. And they gave a lot more than Paul was looking for. They first gave their own selves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. People who not only gave themselves to the Lord, they gave themselves to their beloved Paul. They did that because it was the will of God. You see, the body is one. If it's all a bunch of disjointed hands and arms and legs and feet and noses and ears, and the head is sort of rolling around over there someplace, how much good can that body do? Nothing. It lies there and bleeds until it dies. We are one in the spirit of Christ. Here these people understood it. First Corinthians, they're pretty bad. By the time you get to second Corinthians, they've got some things straightened out. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse three. Here is the will of God clearly tied to our moral responsibility and accountability before God. First Thessalonians 4.3 For this is the will of God. Even your sanctification and he talks about it in one very specific area sex that ye should abstain from fornication. Now you can't get much plainer than that. It is the will of God that you not get involved in sexual immorality. And fornication covers all kinds of horrible immorality. We'll not discuss all of them, but it's a humongous long list. It's not merely adultery. Fornication goes far beyond adultery. The will of God is your sanctification that you should abstain from fornication. Any kind of sex outside of marriage. And believe me, there's a lot of really gross stuff out there. That's the will of God for your life. That includes your thought life, what you do with your eyes, what you do with your ears, what you say with your mouth, what you lust after in your heart, not just what you do with your physical body. First Thessalonians 5.18. Here's a real positive one. And it relates to our accountability. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. When you are faced with all those really nasty things that happen in life, remember we've been talking about sailing slow after fast, and Paul had to face a lot of that kind of stuff, you say, man, how could you be thankful for that? 
You got grabbed by the Jews in the temple. They were going about to kill you. They were beating you up. The Romans came down, dragged you out of the crowd. You began to preach on the stairs. And when you got to that part about you know being sent to the Gentiles, they began to hiss and boo and throw their clothes in the air and throw dirt in the air. And the Romans dragged you inside and they were going to beat you up with whips. How can you be thankful for that, Paul? The Apostle Paul who wrote this is the guy who went through that. He tells us in 2 Corinthians 11, A night and a day have I been in the deep, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, you know, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often. Besides those things which are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. That was more painful to Paul, taking care of the churches, than all that other getting beat up stuff. And he's the man who wrote, In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. We tend to limit Thanksgiving to Thanksgiving Day. For, th for Thursday in November. Do you know in everything? When you um, get a ticket by the policeman, in everything give thanks. Or when you don't get enough sleep at night, in everything give thanks. Or when you get sick and start vomiting, in everything give thanks. When you go through whatever you're going through, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It's a matter of walking by faith to give thanks in all those things. We don't like it that way. We give thanks for the good stuff. But God says he's using those things to do what? What was God's purpose? Back to where we were last week. God's purpose is not to see how much stuff you can accomplish. God's purpose is to conform you to the image of Christ and he knows the precise things that he must bring into your life to burn out the sludge so that you'll be a clean vessel fit for the master's use in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you the will of God also is tied to our moral responsibility and accountability before God because we stand in the presence of others who do not know Christ. And so the way in which we respond will tell them about the Lord that we serve. Peter explains it in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 15. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. When you do what is right, you make the gainsayers ashamed. You shut their mouths. And you know what? That is the will of God to use you in the context of the unbelieving pagan world that watches you 24 hours a day. Number six, the will of God, not the will of man, is, the res is responsible for the distribution of all of the spiritual gifts. The will of God, not the will of man, is responsible for the distribution of all of the spiritual gifts. In other words, you can't pray through to get the gift of tongues or any other spiritual gift. If you go to some of these charismatic places, you know, you'll see people up at the front, and I have seen some of this. I do not habit uh, going to charismatic churches but I have seen this where a group of people will get around somebody who really really wants to get the baptism of the spirit misdefined of course and and you know they oh they really really want to speak in tongues but they just can't do it and so a bunch of people get around and start pushing down on their head and say pray through it pray through it pray through it pray through it you know and then they get slain in the spirit, get flapped back on their back, somebody covers them with a towel, and everybody says, praise the Lord, they've got the baptism. First of all, that's nowhere found in scripture, that kind of stuff. But you can't pray through it because it's the will of God that's responsible for the spiritual gifts, not the will of man. For example, and the Apostle Paul uses this kind of illustration of himself over and over. I'll just give you a few of them. 1 Corinthians 1.1 1, 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. Who made Paul an apostle? The will of God. And Sosthenes, our brother. 
2 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. He starts his, many of his epistles this way. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And Timothy, our brother, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, and with all the saints which are in Achaia. 2 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. What do you think of the next words? By the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. You say, yeah, but that was Paul. That's apostle, gift of apostle. Okay, well, let's give one where, where it relates to all of the spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12 deals with all the spiritual gifts. It has a great big, huge list. You find most of your spiritual gifts listed in uh, 1 Corinthians 12. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. It's not as they will. It's not the gifts that they want. It's not the big showy gifts that they want. He may give them a gift of humble service. And we've been through all the spiritual gifts. You know, we went through all of those. There are only seven of those gifts that were temporary gifts. They were given during the period when, when God was giving new special revelation to the church. The gift of apostle, gift of prophet, healings, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and knowledge. Seven gifts. Those were the gifts that were divine revelatory gifts that were only given during the period of the apostle, but the other 15 gifts are still available. And you don't choose which one you get. It says the Holy Spirit divides to every man severally as he will because he puts all the necessary gifts in every specific body so that that body of believers will have what is necessary to function as a body of Christ, a local church here on earth. For his testimony, he puts you with your gift here in this place. God is distributing, not man, the will of God. Number seven, the will of God underlies both our salvation and our sanctification. Number seven, the will of God underlies both our salvation and our sanctification. Galatians chapter one, verse four, who gave himself for our sins, that's our salvation. Jesus died for our sins. That relates to salvation. And look at the second half. That he might deliver us from this present evil world. That's our sanctification. Salvation in the first phrase. Sanctification in the second phrase. Now listen to the last phrase. According to the will of God and our Father. Our salvation and our sanctification are both grounded upon the will of God. Here's another one over in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Ah, there's sanctification in the end of that verse. And of course, we have another one where Paul speaks of himself as an apostle of Christ by the will of God in Colossians 1.1. 1, 1. Number eight. Our responsibility as believers is to help fellow Christians find and live out the will of God in their lives. Number eight, our responsibility as believers is to help fellow Christians find and live out the will of God in their lives. This is a beautiful verse because it's about a guy who wasn't one of the big guys, he was one of the little guys. And yet this is what he was doing. A guy by the name of Epaphras in Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you? In other words, Epaphras came from Colossae, a servant of Christ. He wasn't a big guy. He saluteth you. Now listen, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of of God. He wasn't praying that they would get rich. He wasn't even praying for them to get healed. He was praying that they would stand perfect and complete in all the will of God for their lives. Do you pray that for me? I hope you do. Do you pray that for your elders? I hope you do. And the deacons, the trustees, I hope you do that we will stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Do you labor at it? Here's a guy who really took it seriously. 
he labored fervently in his prayers. He did it for the believers at Colossae. He wasn't just doing it for Paul. Always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Our responsibility as believers is to help fellow Christians find and live out the will of God in their lives. And one of the key ways you do that is through prayer. Number nine. Number nine. The will of God is for us to go through times of testing. We don't like this one. But the will of God is for us to go through times of testing to purify us before sending his blessing. The will of God is for us to go through times of testing to purify us before sending his blessing. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God you might receive the promise. He's been talking about the things they're suffering. He says you've got to put up with it. You've got to have patience. Remember tribulation work with patience. <laughs> and patience endurance and endurance hope. You have need of patience that after you have done the will of God you might receive the promise. How about 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 17, even clearer? For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. The will of God includes suffering for well-doing. How about chapter 4, verse 2 of 1 Peter? That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the lust of the flesh, but to the will of God. Peter's just been talking about the suffering that the believers go through. And he says the reason for it, the reason God lets you suffer is so that you won't keep walking in the flesh. That he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Same chapter, verse 19, 1 Peter 4, 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Remember back in chapter 3, he talking about the will of God suffering for well-doing. Now he goes back to that in chapter 4, verse 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. And the final one, number 10. Praise the Lord, I actually made it through. We're not quite to 8.15, but almost. Number 10. There are eternal blessings connected with doing, not just knowing the will of God. Number 10. There are eternal blessings connected to doing, not just knowing the will of God. What are those blessings? 1 John 2.17 Actually, verses 15, 16, and 17 all go together, but I'm just going to read you verse 17 because that's the one that talks about the will of God. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Not just he who knoweth the will of God, but he who doeth the will of God. That takes us back to our issue of moral accountability and responsibility. There are eternal blessings connected to being morally accountable and morally responsible and doing the will of God. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We thank you that you have revealed your will to us in the scriptures. We thank you that you empower us to do your will by the Holy Spirit. We thank you that you have commanded us to do your will so that we would know precisely what you expect of us. We thank you, Father, even for the times of suffering that we have to go through when we do your will because it is better to suffer for well-doing than for wrongdoing because someday we receive the blessing that you have promised to those who not merely know your will, but to those who do it.
And so, Father, as we consider the Apostle Paul, as we consider his journey, as we consider his confidence in being in the center of your will, even in the midst of all the horrible things that were happening to him, yet he had a vision beyond the horizon because he looked unto Jesus, the author and finisher of his faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and was set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Father, help us to be a people who wants to do your will, who are eager to do your will, who take advantage not of the flesh trying to do your will, but take advantage of your indwelling spirit, because that is the only one who can empower us to do your will. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.